lot for your time. I know last sessions are generally difficult, but I'll try to make it quick and um, quite exciting. Overall, I just would like to give you a perspective on the challenge that we are facing. So heating and cooling, as such, as Professor mentioned, is going to consume a lot of energy, particularly cooling. Cooling is supposed to really become the biggest energy hog of the next couple of decades. It's going to drive energy demand. It's going to make India the highest energy consuming place in the world. So how do we address this challenge? And I'm going to focus a bit on what we can do right now. What are the things that we can tackle right now that really helps us accelerate this whole decarbonization? So some, some uh, areas that I would like to focus on is potential technologies that are already emerging. We had uh, speakers talk about heat pumps. I'll talk a little bit on what we are currently focusing on in heat pumps and also a potential game changer that has been lurking around us that we have not really paid much attention to. So why is all this important? This is a quick summary on the India's uh, Panchamrit goals. We, we had uh, a speaker talk in the morning, but what it really means is that while we are adding energy requirements, we really need to decarbonize a lot. That's a simple, simple statement. We really need to cut down emissions. We really need to cut down consumption. We really need to make our systems a lot more efficient. None of this is possible without the last three, which is where in the last topic, last section of my presentation, I'll also introduce our industrial energy assessment cell, which is placed in the research park here that's been working with industries to help decarbonize. Okay, so what is all of this heat demand about? Now you can see this is the global heat demand map and it's an astounding 31,000 terawatt hours. To put that in perspective, that is almost 50% of the global energy demand. So a lot of places heating is used for multiple applications. You can see a map here, which talks about industrial heat demand, space heating, domestic water, biomass for cooking. Biomass for cooking is really the very, very small, which is still in the subsistence region. It really accounts for a very small fraction, which is likely to be phased out because of pollution issues. But more and more you see that the industrial demand of heat, which is what is a lot concerning because while we are talking about transition to renewable energy, Heat is something we don't have a thorough answer for. And we talked about heat pumps, that's one of the biggest uh, uh, technologies that is being uh, evaluated for transition to this. Also because you get on the grid, you, deal, you, you green yourself much faster. You already know the challenges that uh, European countries are facing because of the Russian gas challenge. So where is industrial heat used? A lot of us know heat is required for heavy manufacturing process, cement, steel, um, mineral extraction, min mining and all, min uh, the extraction of metals from minerals and all. But a lot more of heat is required in the low temperature range, just above boiling. Anything that contains carbon, carbonaceous materials, uh, carbon, I mean carbohydrates and any kind of organic material, the heat requirement is not more than 150 or 180 degrees C. And this is the criminal waste of fossil fuel that we do to produce this kind of heat. And this is exactly what we want to tackle in terms of addressing this whole challenge that I showed in the last slide. Now, where are these kind of heat used for? You can see most of it, we use it in our home for boiling, pasteurization, a lot of industrial processes as we advance, as our economies mature, as our purchasing power become better, a lot more of such processes are being used to produce goods that we need. And all of this is in the temperature range of less than 120 to 150 degrees C. And we should not really be burning fossil fuel to generate them. Now, to give you an example, this is a slightly older report, 2020, where we talk about some of the few industries that we touch upon on a daily basis, dairy, food, textile, pharma, automotive. Now, this is in India. Now, what is the potential to substitute that is currently being used in terms of fired sources? So the motto I have is, can I fire my boiler? Do, can I eliminate any fired sources? This is the potential. There's almost 27 gigawatt hour thermal capacity, gigawatt, gigawatt thermal, not gigawatt hour, gigawatt thermal installed capacity, out of which I can economically right now, without any kind of interventions or subsidies or any kind of payback, I mean, any kind of uh, 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 policy benefits, I can right now replace almost 50% of it. And while, how do I do this? Uh, we talked about a couple of technologies that you can look at. One is uh, solar thermal, solar heat is free and available, but the challenge has been, it, is not, it does not pass the economic viability test that Professor Jujunwala talked about. So what else is there? We talk about heat pumps, 
um, uh, Ravi from Danfoss talked about heat pumps. They are a beautiful technology that can not just be used for only space heating and space cooling, that can be developed and deployed to do a lot more heating. And in India alone, just based on a rough total market size, this is a large market, 42,000 crores of equipment that's going to supply more than 13 gigawatts of uh, thermal heat. And this is only likely to grow because these are industries that are growing at a very, very fast rate. So if such a potential exists, now what is the challenge? Challenge has been the perception, you know. These are the fuels that people have been using so far, except say the last two, coal and biomass, which is used in large plants. But a lot of small applications have been using these fuels. Traditionally, the mindset has been that these fuels have been subsidized and cheap, so a lot of systems exist that currently supply heat, burning some of them, and you can now look at the cost of heat. So it is also about technology that exists, but it's not being adopted because of inertia in the system. So that's where we are working hard to deploy what we call the heat pump based system. So there are two technologies that I will briefly talk about, one of which is high heat pump hot water system, primarily for a lot of applications where you don't need uh, heats more than 90 degrees C, and then heat pump steam system, which we have uniquely developed in our lab and trying to commercialize right now. There the focus is on providing the low pressure uh, steam applications. Now, why is it so great? So, uh, uh, Ravi talked about CO2 heat pumps. So we are also developing one of these systems, primarily because you can see the, this is being built for a, a commercial canteen, Akshaya Patra, you might know in uh, Bangalore, which does a couple of uh, hundreds of thousands of meals a day. Why is it so great? Now you can see a single system can deliver hot water. This is at almost 90 degrees C. And then chilled water, almost at 5 degrees C. And an overall benefit, as they call it, as combined COP, coefficient of performance, almost greater than 6. What does this mean? For every unit of electricity I consume, I'm producing 6 units of energy. So this is something that we really need to benefit. So in most of the current systems, what do we do? I run an air conditioner here, I reject the heat. So I'm only consuming for every unit of electricity, three units of cooling benefit that I get. And in a heating system for every unit of fuel that I fire, I hardly use 0 0.8, 0 0.7. So that is the efficiency of conversion of most current system. With a heat pump, of course, it, it relies on the thermodynamic process where you extract cooling space, I mean energy from a cooled space, and then you reject it at a hot space. And depending on how you design the system, you can achieve all of this benefit. CO2 is an emerging technology, primarily because of two reasons. One is that it is a natural refrigerant. A lot of challenges have been there when you use synthetic refrigerants, ozone depletion, and a lot of global warming potential. CO2 is emerging. It is an expensive technology right now. It costs more than five times of what a commercial vapor compression technology does. But nevertheless, this particular system that we are building allows us in a single frame to do five degree cooling on one side and 95 degree heating on the other side. So if you can imagine the kind of processes that we are talking about in dairy, for example, I boil milk to pasture, I mean heat it to kill all of whatever uh, microbes are there and then I pasteurize them. To pasteurize them, I cool it down to four degrees immediately. So what do I do? I have a chiller and I have a boiler. So these kind of systems can really help improve their energy efficiency quite a bit and also something that really cuts down on the emission. So the next thing I was talking about is, when you talk about heat, I said, a lot of it is less than 150. And the biggest reason industry does not want to change is this small region beyond 100, where currently no big solutions exist. Whatever heat pump technology, whatever we talk about, are all less than 100 degrees C. And many industries have this small region beyond 100. They need to run at 105, 110, 120. In that short region, because of which, Boilers are needed, fossil fire systems are needed. So that's where we worked on to develop this particular technology called the steam heat pumps. Okay. World over heat pumps are being currently looked upon as a substitution for natural gas, as a substitution for any fired sources. In fact, uh, in a lot of places in India itself, right now there is a ban on combusting any other fuel for boiler except natural gas, particularly in Delhi because of the pollution issues. So given that scenario, these are technologies that are existing zero to five years, definitely commercially uh, available right now. Commercial viability by payback, now it's only about scaling up in the market. Now I, I'll shift my focus to bit on cooling. So while heat pumps are something that can deliver both heating and cooling, 
but the global cooling demand is going to far outstrip the requirement of heating. Heating is going to stabilize. A lot of it is driven by manufacturing and industrial processes as the global heat, the heating continues. The number of cooling requirement days, COCD, COCD, number of cooling days that's required in India has already gone up by 28%. It's only likely to go up. So which essentially drives this, I mean, this image that you see here, image that you see here, Indian cooling demand is essentially something that's going to drive a lot of capacity additions in the world, electricity capacity additions in the world. And this is how the split is going to look like by 2050, where 37% of the global electricity demand is going to be for cooling and about 12.5% for heating. So this is something that we need to tackle. Now, the question we want to ask is, of course, I can improve efficiency, I can make things better, and I, I can give you a bit more statistics. No, see, the other statistic that I really want you to pay attention is the, this particular graph here, which is the share of peak electricity load. So this afternoon, we talked about peak electricity load. Now, a lot of peak electricity load is going to go towards cooling, which essentially means that I'm going to uh, take a high-grade energy and to supply a very low-grade energy. I'm going to use all of that electricity where this cooling demand is likely to occur in a very demand-shifted pattern where you don't have much renewable available. You don't have much uh, the solar or whatever grid electricity is not green enough. So how do we manage that? And this becomes larger and larger as the affluence of the community starts increasing. So how do we manage? So this is a fairly big challenge. And how do we address that? To understand this, we just want to look upon this particular graph, you know, this particular schematic. This has driven our cooling systems for more than a century. I mean, ever since Carrier had the vapor compression refrigeration system developed, Whatever we do, we have only been working on this. We have improved refrigerants, we have improved motors, we have improved heat exchangers, we have improved approach temperatures, but we have not changed the basic process. We have not changed anything from this. And this is also the heat pump technology where I do recover the heat from the condenser for using it. So by system engineering, I can make it better. Are there anything else that I can do to do one, first integrate renewable energy so that I can make this better? Alternative sources of cooling that is available in the world that I can tap? Are there any untapped energy sources that I can use? So before we go there, so this is kind of a roadmap of how these uh, heating and cooling technologies are evolving. So right now what we are primarily focused on is improving these efficiency, refrigerant substitution, finding better alternatives. The second thing is demand side management by using hydrates, slurries, uh, Kaushal, Dr. Kaushal talked about thermal energy storage. We do have some technologies that can improve the thermal energy storage and of course, energy monitoring and control. So all of these things give you incremental benefit. I can make my system better by 15%, 20%, 30%. Can I reduce the energy consumption by 90%? Can I get the same amount of cooling with only 10% of the energy? One of the solution that we are wanting to identify that has been in commercial, that has been in some pilot implementation is what's called as the SWAC, seawater air conditioning. I'll talk about it a little bit later. So in a slightly midterm, which is five to 10 year, there is a lot of potential in chemicals, materials. So right now we talked about materials for energy storage. One of the key aspect and key material for energy storage also in heating is by this method called as the thermochemical heat pumps. So many of you have heard about vapor absorption machines, which is a VAM that is used by many companies which have waste heat. So you can use waste heat available in a process to boost up. So you don't consume electricity, you use heat for cooling. So that is done by the thermochemical heat pumps. In this, there has been certain chemicals, say for example, phosphoric acid, which is exceptional in its behavior, but it's also exceptional in corrosion. So it has been a materials nightmare. People have abandoned phosphoric acid primarily because it corrodes everything. So can we do something to improve the material so that I can really use this. I'll tell you why this is so exciting because I can take a heat that is available in a cooling tower as low as 30 degrees C and with very little electricity input, I can boost it up to 90 degrees C. Whereas if I were to do it using the same vapor compression refrigeration, I need to use a compressor to put in the energy, whereas phosphoric acid can do that with, with very little pumping power. But why can't I use it right now? I do have some material challenges, but that's going to be something that's exciting. Steam compression, where I talked about low pressure steam, right now we are able to generate 120. Uh, if you want to go a little higher so I can cover more industrial. So these are something that's going to happen uh, in the next five to 10 years. 
And a larger, very long, long out there, uh, Professor Gopalan talked about the magnetic, uh, magnetocaloric uh, refrigeration. So we do have some trials, but these are technologies that are under the category of solid state refrigeration. <coughs> it's limited by material. A lot of them utilizes rare earth materials like lanthanum, gadolinium, and all that. So that's something that probably we will keep a lookout for. But I'm most excited about this particular technology that I'm going to talk about a little bit more. So the graph that you see on the leftmost side is called a thermocline. What's a thermocline? Basically, that is the seawater temperature as you go deep. And it's more or less stable at 4 degrees beyond a depth of 1,000 meters or 1 kilometer. So here, this is basically the uh, surface. So at the surface, it's near about 24 degrees to 28 degrees, depending on which part of the sea you are in. But as you go deeper, irrespective of which part of the globe you are in, the seawater temperature is more or less about 4 degrees, except very near the poles. So this is because there is a lot of under ocean current. So this <clears throat> particular source of energy is something of an infinite capacity. It's not being very effectively utilized, but I'll talk about how you can utilize that. The second thing, I mean, these two are <coughs> experimental in nature. Where this is the magnetocaloric method, where it's entirely solid state, that you move a magnet in and out of a magnetic field, it heats up and cools down, and we can use that heating and cooling to extract the benefit. And high COPs are there, but there is a material limitation. There is not enough material, and we don't want to get into another lithium, cobalt, or nickel. The thermochemical method, as I said, it's, it's a clever organization of chemicals. But this is something that will evolve. As we, as we go forward, there is going to be multiples of technologies. And I certainly see that this is something that will evolve significantly. Uh, but right now, for the near term, I would like to talk a bit more on the seawater air conditioning system. What I show here is the Bay of Bengal uh, temperature. This is the Bay of Bengal. And you know, Bay of Bengal is very hot. It's about 30 degrees at some places. But as you go down, even at a 200 meter depth, it's almost all, uh, it already at 15 degrees. And if I go down to a kilometer, it goes down to 4 degrees, which means I have chilled water year round. Doesn't matter what the seasons are. Year round, that, this is what you see here, the tropics. Year round, it's almost at always four degrees. And of course, depending on which location you are in, you can po possibly have variations in surface temperature. But at a depth of about 1,000 meters to 1,500 meters, it more or less remains the same. So how can I exploit this? You can exploit this by putting up <coughs> what's called as the seawater air conditioning system, which is basically a large pipe. You can see some pilot plants. This is in Hawaii where they are done, use this to extract uh, seawater to cool resorts. Essentially, the advantage of the system, if you can imagine, if I put a pipe at a depth of one kilometer, I don't need that kind of pumping power because the entire hydrostatic pressure, the seawater is going to apply the pressure and push up the water. So all I need is a pipe that is having very good integrity. Now, HDPE is a material that has great thermal properties, very integral, so I don't lose that much of heat to the water. So I can pump up the water from deep under sea, fairly clean water, no debris, nothing. And that can be connected to a district cooling network. Of course, this requires certain kind of large loads. I can't do these systems for small loads. I need upwards of, say, 6,000 tons. So where do these exist? I'll give you an example. Right in uh, Nemili, near Chennai, there is a uh, 150 MLD uh, seawater desalination plant that's picking up water at 15 meters from the sea. You can easily go down to 1,000 meters. Energy cost is next to nothing because uh, you don't require energy to pull up the deep sea water. Material cost capex is there, but a 150 MLD can already give you 6,000 tons of refrigeration. And the plant already exists, and the benefit is that water is pure water. Now, there is already operational issues at the Nemili plant because of seawater debris. And this water is really pure water, and you can already desalinate them. So you can really look at how you can do synergistically. There is a water problem. There is also a cooling problem. How do you combine it? And these are fairly endless opportunities, because seawater, as you already know, is a limitless uh, source of energy. That's what we can use. So is this new? People are trying some pilots. So why are they trying? It's at almost at 10% of a traditional chiller cost. The same 6,000 tons. If I were to do using a traditional uh, chiller system, I need six megawatts of power. If I do it through this kind of a system, I, I probably need about uh, half a megawatt. 
So that is the huge difference that you see. CapEx intensive, yes, but we talked about what happens to thermal power plants if you go all renewable. Maybe all thermal power plants are on the coast. They can all become district, what, district cooling plants. They can all set up data centers because data centers need huge cooling demand. And these are right sources for them. And this can be monetized much better. Much larger life, no rotating components. It's basically a heat exchanger that you can maintain. And of course, easily integratable to a renewable load. So these are some of the existing plants that exist across the world. Uh, some uh, sample in Hong Kong, a lot of it in, uh, in the Nordic countries and a few in the US. This is very interesting. This is a resort in Bora Bora, where they have uh, air conditioned the entire resort using deep sea water. So um, just as an example, I talked about the data center. To put it in perspective, data centers currently emit 2% of global CO2. We are all focused on decarbonizing cement, decarbonizing steel, decarbonizing transport. But data center is going to contribute to 14% of carbon emission in not a very long time away. So how do you decarbonize them? One of the opportunities, one of the main consumption for data center is cooling equipment. 50% of the load goes to cooling equipment. Already Microsoft is talking about putting a data center under the sea. Now, that's probably not very practical. It's going to be capex intensive. Rather, we could extract the seawater to cool them. And I mean, if you look at the distribution of data center in India, most of it is in coastal regions, Mumbai and Chennai. And it's likely to be because of uh, optical fiber connectivity and all of that. So if we were to only look at the current capacity, one gigawatt data center already in 2021, supposed to reach to two gigawatt. And we can see that we can reduce the cooling load to 100 megawatt from a gigawatt estimate. So these are certain things that we can really think of. And I think while we look at technology upgradation, we should also look at resources around us that could potentially be very, very uh, uh, scalable in a very large scale. The last thing I want to talk about, we also talked about um, energy storage. One thing is cooling as a battery. At a small scale, what we have is hydrates and ice slurry, which could potentially <coughs> be a very cost-effective way to so store renewable energy. Ice slurries have already been used for hundreds of years for storing fish and other things. But if you are able to generate it in a much more uh, uh, renewable integrated fashion, I think compared to lithium ion, it can be a fairly more cost-effective. So with that, thank you very much. I would just like to share this last slide where this is a CSR initiative that we have launched this morning. Dr. Kalai Chel, we talked about energy efficiency and energy audits. So we have launched about four, five centers across the country that does energy audits for all the MSMEs. And what we really like to work with all of you is to push forward this initiative and three, how scalable it can be. Thank you very much for the time and uh, happy to take any questions.